Hello, space fans. Welcome back to another episode of Space to Alive. Now, I hope everyone is strapping themselves in for the next 60 minutes because we've got another cracker of a show for you. We're bringing you another Meet an Astronaut special with ex-NASA astronaut, ISIS commander and colonel in the US Air Force, Terry Burtz. First of all, a very warm welcome to you, Terry. How are you doing? Doing good. It's, uh, it's good to be here and, and talk to you again. Awesome. Yeah, I think we've got an incredible show coming up for you guys tonight. So if you have any questions for us, let us know in the chat, um, wherever you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook, and we'll try and get to your questions later on in the show. We also have a short segment of our program dedicated to some kids' questions, which I'm really excited to ask you. Um, but let's, let's get things kicked off. Um, did you always want to be an astronaut? <laughs> Yeah, you know, ever since I was little, that's what I wanted to do. When I was growing up, I had pictures of airplanes and rockets and galaxies and that stuff on my wall. That's that was what I was all about. So it was um, something I wanted to do, but it's kind of a crazy dream. Uh, and it was when I was a teenager, I read a book called The Right Stuff. Um, a family friend and it said, "Hey, you should read this." And so I read the book, and it was amazing. And that kind of showed me my path. So I was very lucky. I got to do the thing that I wanted to do when I was a little boy. Great. And how, how, how was your training process? Um, sorry, your selection process before your training process? Would you just yeah, find the selection. I don't know what's harder, the selection or the training. <laughs> um, it was long. Yeah. We had, um, it was probably a year and a half between when NASA announced that there was going to be a, uh, uh, a new space shuttle class. And when I finally got to interview and then they finally made the decision, it was a long time. There was a lot of paperwork back in the day. It was actually paper. <laughs> you had to go to the printer and, and print out, you know, an encyclopedia. Um, now it's all online, but you do that. Then we went, when I did it, we had one interview. It was a week long interview. Now they have two shorter interviews where you come down to Houston and then you sit around and wait and wait and wait. And, um, and then got the call, but it was a long process. Was How was the moment when you found out you're selected in 2000? <laughs> it was pretty awesome. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that moment, I was at work, I'd just flown an F-16 test mission and I had my whole team around. And of course the whole base knew there was a handful of us that were waiting to hear, um, cause I was at Edwards Air Force Base, you know, everybody there wants to be an astronaut. So a lot of people had applied and they knew that I was down to the, you know, the final group of people. And uh, the chief of the astronaut office called me, Charlie Precourt. And he said, hey, Terry, do you want to, um, are you still interested in coming to Houston? And I was like, let me think about that. Yes. <laughs> um, but he said, you can't tell anybody because Congress hasn't approved the, the list. You know, your class hasn't been approved yet. So don't tell anybody. So everybody's sitting around watching my face, you know, turn pink and red and, and then they were like, what do you say? What do you say? And I was like, I don't know, nothing. And I, you know, I couldn't say anything. And then about a minute later on the squatter and um, loudspeaker, it said, you know, celebration party for Terry after work today. So uh, it was pretty fun. It was a pretty cool moment. What, why, what, um, in terms of your selection, do you think there was a specific trait that they were impressed by? Um, yeah. So besides my good looks and, and humility, uh, I think <clears throat> one of the things that I had done that really stood out was that I had minored in French at the Air Force Academy and I had done an exchange at the French Air Force Academy and I had done an exchange with a Finnish family in Finland. And so I had some international experience. I could speak different languages. Yeah. And, you know, at the time we were building the International Space Station. And so being able to work with foreign countries, especially Russia, because a lot of our work is in a Russian language was was good and there was lots and lots of smart smarter than me test pilots and stuff but i did have that french background and i think that really set me apart plus it didn't hurt that charlie precourt the chief of the astronaut office had also done the same french exchange 10 years before me um so that was that was probably a good thing but that's you know there's a lot of people that are really smart and and good at what they do and so it's important to have something to to separate you or to make you stand out yeah, we'll talk. We'll talk a little bit later about soft skills and technical skills, which I read about um, in your latest book, which is how to <laughs> yes, 
and inside yes. gets, and insiders guys are leaving planet earth um which i should <laughs> help tell everyone tuning in that we're actually offering an exclusive chance for you guys to get your hands on a signed and personalized copy of terry's book just head to the description um head to the link in the description and head to the space door website uh, where you can grab your own copy of a signed, signed personalized uh, copy from terry um, we'll talk a bit more about the book in due course, but let's let's talk a little bit about the training. Your training. Um, mm -hmm. I, think you're, I think you're in a swimming pool over here in a rather large um, spacesuit. Um, talk, talk us through this picture. Yeah, I see. That's a picture with me and Samantha Cristoforetti uh, doing spacewalk training underwater. Um, there's a big pool here in Houston. I'm in Houston right now, and it's called the NBL which stands for big pool. And uh, they say it's the world's largest. So we have a model of the ISS on, in this pool, although it's only half the ISS because the ISS is so big, it wouldn't fit in the pool. And uh, you go underwater, the big, it's basically the same suit, except for the backpack doesn't work. We have a, an air hose that goes to the surface to provide cooling and, and air. Um, in space, you don't have that. It's everything is self-contained. Other than that, it's basically the same suit that we wear. We have these support divers. You know, each astronaut has two or three support divers that are helping them, making sure they're safe, um, moving equipment back and forth as we need to swap things out. So that training is really good. It is a physical workout. It's the suit weighs probably 300 pounds or so. Wow, okay. Plus all your equipment. So it's 400 pounds or more. And in order to move, you're pushing 400 pounds of water. It's Archimedes principle. So just moving around is a workout. And so, and you're constantly squeezing in these big thick gloves that are pressurized. So the NBL runs are six hours. Um, and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's really good training, but it is a pretty tough workout. And how well do you think it prepares you for the real thing? Oh, really? Well, I mean, the NBL training is invaluable. If we didn't have um, that training, it would be, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to do it. I did three spacewalks on my last mission um, and they all went really well. They were super busy, very intense to say the least, but um, it was because of that training and the work of the divers, the work of our training team and engineers that got us ready for that. That's a pretty funny picture too. Getting the helmet on, I always have a hard time getting over my head because I have this giant head. So I'm Samantha's kind of a normal sized woman, and I'm I, I'm <laughs> average, but I have a big head. So you can see yeah. in that picture just how big my head is. They yeah. actually had to come up with a unique procedure. I had to rotate it 90 degrees and angle it and pull it and then rotate it just to get it over my giant noggin. Oh no, I think I think you also mentioned in the book that all NASA helmets are the same size. Like they don't have a yeah yeah. That, that's yeah, very, very true. Right. Well, I think we've already got a question in from our audience, uh, Ground Based Space. I hope you guys can hear me better now. Um, and Ground Based Space is asking about your experience um, between in the comfort levels between the space shuttle and the Soyuz capsule. Right. So you're in a spacesuit in both capsules and spacesuits aren't really that comfortable. They weigh 20 kilos or 40 pounds and they're bulky. And, you know, so that's not great. It's not a lot of fun being in a spacesuit. It is kind of cool, but you know, for hours and hours, it gets old after a while. So that's the same, but the space shuttle had big, like, it's like being an airline pilot, the chair, you know, you have a big cockpit, you have room. If you have to reach over to touch the guy next to you, if you need to tap him on the shoulder or whatever, um, in the Soyuz, you're, you're cramped, your knees, you can't see my knees right now, but they're up in my stomach. You can't stretch your body out because the Soyuz isn't that big. You have, your knees have to be in your chest. Um, it is a, it is a tight fit and you're, you know, you're shoulder to shoulder with the person next to you. So, um, it's a very different experience. Plus in the shuttle you have as a pilot, I had this beautiful windows, you know, like an airline pilot has windows to look out. The poor guys downstairs didn't have any windows, but at least I did upstairs. But in the Soyuz, the first two and a half minutes, you don't have anything because there's a big metal um, shroud, abyakatel is the Russian word, over it. And uh, and then once they pop off, there's little hatches up here, but that's it, you know, so you really can't see out as much. Wow, okay. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit more about 
um, what happens once you actually get up on the ISS. But before that, um, there's also a huge passion you have for storytelling and photography, <laughs> which, we're going to, which we're going to talk about. But before, right. before we talk about it, we have a short trailer to show everyone. Oh, cool. We're trying to set a world record. It's the so fastest it's time ever to go from one place on the Earth, over both poles, and back to the same point on the Earth, all in under 48 hours. Calling themselves one more orbit, their goal is to complete the fastest circumnavigation of the Earth via the North and South Poles in a business jet. And they're live streaming the whole thing. Wow, that sounds extremely exciting. Tell us, tell us more about One More Orbit. That was an amazing project. So um, I left NASA a few years ago, and one of the things I want to do is film and TV. And I had a chance to direct this documentary. Uh, a friend of mine and business partner, Hamish Harding, who's the British guy in that, in that um, wanted to do this One More Orbit project. And originally, he was going to take an Apollo astronaut and fly them around the planet as a kind of a raising awareness kind of project. Uh, it was on the 50th anniversary of Apollo a year and a half ago. Um, but those guys were so busy. Anyway, the long story short is we decided to make a documentary about it. So we took off and landed at the Kennedy Space Center um, at 9.32 in the morning, the same time Apollo 11 lifted off. We went over the North Pole and South Pole and landed back on the SLF runway, the shuttle landing facility, the same one I use for Endeavor on my space shuttle flight. Yeah. Uh, and we set the world, we, we broke the world record by a lot, by, you know, over five hours. Um, but we were really, one of the big parts of that film was about uh, the environment and talking about how to, things that we can do to help, you know, improve the environment. And we worked with a company called the Carbon Underground to make the flight carbon negative, but also to promote what they're doing by changing and managing soil use, you know, farming techniques and, and, yeah. and that kind of thing. Um, to uh, to take carbon out of the air and put it back underground where it started. Wow, what, what it was fun. You? Like I said, I yeah. fell in love with directing, and it's. I got to be honest, it's cool to have a movie on Amazon and iTunes, and you know, it's on like twenty different streamers, and um, the French Channel Canal just picked it up. So it's really cool to have that you know first step done. Great, what an exciting initiative! Well, if you guys want to check that out, search for One More Orbit. Um, on yeah. Netflix, Amazon, Amazon TV. Um, now we've got a picture of you uh, up on the ISS here. Um, and I'm su super interested to talk about once you're, once you've launched, once you're in orbit, you're on the ISS, um, how, how does it feel? So the big difference, you know, you launch in a Soyuz nowadays, or now there's the SpaceX capsule and later this year, there'll be a Boeing capsule, but you launch in a capsule now that there's no more space shuttle. So it's really small and cramped. And you open up that hatch and there is a giant space station. It's like a 747, you know, it's a really big area. Um, so the first thing you notice is, man, this place is big once you get to the space station. And the, uh, the other thing you notice as soon as the rocket engine shut down eight and a half minutes after launch is that you're floating. And that is a very powerful sensation. Um, it's very intense, especially the for, for first time rookie flyers. Uh, it feels like you're falling and um, it's, it's, it's an experience unlike anything else to be able to float. And then you look out and you see the planet, which is a really powerful emotional experience to look back and see the earth. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's a lot of things are happening in those first minutes and hours in space. And after spending a few more days, of course, on your first mission, you only spent a couple of weeks up on there, but your second one was nearly 200 yeah. days. Um, right. How does the connection and bond form over time with your teammates? So the, the folks that you launch with, uh, the three people in a Soyuz or the four people in a SpaceX, you spend a lot of time with. You, you go through all your training, every day you're doing something with them. You travel to Russia together, you travel to Europe together, you travel to Japan together to do training. So you really get to know that crowd. But the space station, there's three or four people in space. 
and then three or four people come up and then that crew comes down and then a new crew comes up. So there's this constant overlap yep. and you really, you meet the other people and you see them a couple of times in training, but you don't see them that much. So in some ways you're kind of forming the crew once you get to space. And then uh, when those guys leave, then the next crew comes up and now you have to form a new crew in space. So it's mm -hmm. an interesting dynamic, but the good thing is, you know, astronauts and cosmonauts are, are pretty, uh, we have a common value system for the most part. And even though we're different uh, nationalities and speak different languages uh, and we all have the same mission goal. And so um, it works out pretty good. Yeah, great. Um, one of the things I read in your book is um, every Friday evening, one of the things you most enjoyed was um, flying down, floating down, I should say, to yeah. the Russian segment of the ISS and actually spending some time with the cosmonauts. Um, and you yes. mentioned how it was at a time of, uh, I, I, I could put it as, inter international tension. Absolutely, um, yeah. How did, how did you deal with that then? So, um, you know, that my mission was 2014 and 2015. So it was kind of the beginning of this really bad phase that we're in right now between the West and Russia. Crimea happened, Ukraine, the civil war was happening. Uh, the airliner shoot down was happening. We had just applied sanctions. So, you know, a lot of bad stuff was was happening. Mm -hmm. So we didn't ignore it. We didn't pretend like it didn't exist. A lot of times in Russia, after a training event, you, everybody does a toast. And uh, we would always say, hey, look, politics is politics, but let's talk about our mission. And then we toast our, the crew or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of how we had dealt with it. Politics is going on. That's not us. We, you know, that's not our job. That's not our lives. Let's focus on having a safe space flight and also being friends. And so I, I, the, the thing I was most proud about when I was commander of the station is that our crew got along really well, despite all these things happening. We're still friends to this day. The, my one more orbit movie, if you watch that, um, Gennady Padalka was a big part of that film. He joined us for one of our legs and he was my Russian crewmate when, from space. Um, he actually has more time in space than any other human, 879 days. So. Wow. Uh, that was, it was a tough time. It ain't getting any easier. And, uh, the, I think astronauts and cosmonauts do a good job of showing people how we can and should get along down here on earth. Right. Was there any kind of pat on the back when you got back? Um, certainly. Well, part of it is you go to Russia for a big debrief. It's like a week long process. They have this big ceremony all the people, like even civilians from Star City come out to welcome the astronauts and cosmonauts home. And I got so much stuff. I had boxes and boxes of these really nice gifts. Some of them, some of the things on my shelf behind me were gifts that I got, you know, or like just little models or whatever. So they were um, very appreciative. They were, they were absolutely great hosts um, and very gracious. So that, you know, that was a nice part of the mission. Right. Well, talking about different parts of the mission, of course, when you were there for 200 days, uh, you did a bunch of science experiments. Do you, yes. remember any, do you remember any as being your favorite? Um, <clears throat> it's hard to say what's the favorite. There was over 250 that we did. Um, there was a couple of really cool ones. One of the coolest I really didn't have much to do with is something called AMS. It's this big, you know, refrigerator, bigger than a refrigerator size uh, particle detector outside. I, when I did my spacewalk, I kind of crawled up to it, but um, it is just sitting there in space. It's been there for 10 years now, uh, looking at particles, these um, subatomic, really they're looking for helium antimatter molecules. And that is going to tell us hopefully how much dark matter there is out in the universe and help us understand dark matter. Because there's these concepts of dark matter and dark energy that make up over 90% of the universe and we don't know what they are. Yeah. So I thought that was pretty cool that we have an experiment on the ISS trying to figure out what the universe is made of. Um, I did uh, salmonella and E. coli vaccine, ironically, experiments for a major drug company. Um, I did uh, some really cool material science, some combustion science, which is good for uh, physicists. Well, combustion science would be probably chemical engineers who are gonna use that to figure out how to uh, how combustion works, because if we can make that more efficient, that would be really amazing. 
Um, I did a lot of medical experiments on my own body. One of the most important uh, experiments I did was actually on rodents. We had mice and the ISS has done a lot of rodent research. And that's really important, again, for a major uh, pharmaceutical company to improve drugs. They were looking at bone and muscle drugs uh, in the experiment I did. So lots, I could talk about science for hours. I did a lot. <laughs> yeah. Did, did these experiments kind of overlap or were they like day one, day two, day three, or did they go off for a long time? It, it depended. Like I said, some of them, we never did anything or you take a box, you'd plug it in and turn the switch on. And then the scientists from the ground would run it remotely. Others we were really intently involved in. The rodent research took days and days and days of multiple crewmates. I did that with Scott Kelly, my crewmate, Scott Kelly, and um, we spent lots and lots of hours dealing with mice. And so it, it really depended. Sometimes you'd get a little five minute training video because you don't ha have time to train on all this stuff. And even if you did, it would have been a year or two years ago, you know? So if you have training, can, can you remember something you did two years ago? So they would send us little like in, just in time training videos. And those were really useful. So you'd watch the video, you know, insert the tube here, you know, do this, plug this in here, how to do the experiment, and then you'd go do it. And then you'd move on to the next thing. Yeah, great. Well, well it's good that you've, you've contributed so much to space science in that case then. It was fun. I'm just a fighter pilot, but you know, I'm not a scientist, but it was, you know, that was, it was pretty cool to have that opportunity. Great. Um, now on your second, uh, sorry, on your first mission, STS-130, uh, one of the things you did was actually take um, up the, the Coppola, which plays really nicely into your passion for photography. So I yes. wanted to talk about your bond with the Coppola. I, I see a picture there. I'm, I'm waving. It's funny. I set up a camera to take like a picture every five seconds in the Russian module, looking through the Russian window and it, go. And it would just take a picture every five seconds. And then I'd float down through about three or four modules, go in the cupola and, you know, wave at the camera. And then I'd have to float back down and turn the camera off. <laughs> That's how I got that picture. Um, but the cupola is a seven windowed module. You can see it there in the background. It's actually on the bottom of the ISS. So uh, in my mind, Earth is that way. Like just when I think about being in space, seeing the planet, I always think that Earth is up there. Um, and it's amazing. It's everybody's favorite place. I was really lucky and then I got to install it on STS-130. And then I went back and I got to open up the window. There's these window covers. So I got to open up the window covers for the first time and, you know, be me and Jeff Williams were in there. We were the first people to look through the cupola windows. Um, and then... Wow. Yeah. Four years later, five years later, I went back and got to use it. Um, so it's a really cool place. I helped make an IMAX movie called A Beautiful Planet. It's an awesome movie. If you want to see a great space film, uh, Tony Myers directed it, and it kind of got me into filmmaking. But it's it's a great film. But a lot of that was filmed through the cupola. Right. We'll talk about spacewalking in just a moment. I'll go back to the uh, this image here. But um, for, for everyone tuning in, Terry actually has the record of taking the most pictures from the ISS. And it's, I think right. it's over 300,000 pictures. Yeah. So there was some poor you... guy here in Houston. His job was to count pictures. So he was happy when I got back to Earth, I think. Great. Well, we've got a few, we've got a few of them here. Um, we'll show the, audience, um, show the audience a bunch of them. So if you want to talk through this one, maybe. You know, I'll... In the ocean, you can see these blue and turquoise islands. In the Pacific, there's thousands of islands. Uh, in the Indian Ocean, you can see it. In the Red Sea, in the Persian Gulf, you can see these kind of things. But this is the Caribbean, and the Bahamas especially are so intense. And that really big blue turquoise aqua color is unlike anywhere else. You could see it with the Apollo guys who went to the moon could see it from the moon. Uh, and it, I've never been to the Bahamas, um, and I need to go after seeing that from space, but it's really, it's really beautiful. Yeah. What about this one? Now that one is, uh, the UK and Ireland, happy late St. Patrick's day. Um, and you, London is, I, I don't know if you can see it in that picture, but it's right off the corner and off in the distance is the Northern lights. And, um, this picture was really cool because it was at nighttime. And so the moon was lighting up the earth. The reason you can see 
sort of see the earth and the clouds and stuff is from moonlight, which is really amazing. But those, the Northern lights are so beautiful. The Southern lights are even more spectacular because we're closer to them. So like in December and January, in the winter time, you see the Northern lights in May, June, July is when you see the Southern lights from, from space and from earth too. Um, but they're really amazing. It's, it's, um, uh, giant explosions from the sun, these particles go flying through the solar system. It takes about a day, sometimes a few days to get to earth, hits our magnetic field, gets captured by the magnetic field and funneled down to the North magnetic pole or the South magnetic pole. Uh, so it's, um, it's, it's beautiful from space. Yeah. Just a question that comes to mind is, um, earlier on, earlier on in your career, you were, you were just a fighter pilot, you were not just that you were a fighter pilot, which is pretty cool. Right. And now, now you're talking about all this amazing science that goes on up in space. How was how was the transition for you from going from a fighter pilot to to a scientist in a way? Yeah, uh, it's a big transition. And and actually, test pilot school was in between. So I, I flew F-16s operationally. Then I was a test pilot only for two years, and then I came to NASA. Yeah. So the test pilot was like there were lots of um, Lockheed engineers there, there were lots of civilians. So it was kind of like an intermediate step between going from a hardcore frontline mm -hmm. fighter pilot to NASA, which is a civilian organization. It's, it's not a military organization at all. And I wore, you know, jeans and a polo every day for work. Um, <laughs> so it was a, it was a big transition, but I liked it. I loved it. It was, it was very different, but, um, I, I like variety. So it was good mm -hmm. to have something different. Were the, were the jets easier at NASA? Were the what easier at NASA? Uh, the jets, the jets you practiced on at oh, NASA. Oh, well, yeah. So we flew at NASA, we flew T-38s, which is a, a training aircraft. And it was um, significantly, I mean, it's a simple airplane. When I was in pilot training and I had to fly the T-38, I thought it was the most complicated, difficult thing I'd ever flown in my life. Um, but then, you know, 10 years later, I'm an astronaut and it was like a piece of cake. You didn't have to think about it. You know, I could, I, I haven't flown one for years, but I could go take off and fly it without batting an eye. You know, it's, it's like riding a bike. Wow. I imagine I could say riding, riding a jet, riding a jet was as easy as riding his bike. But, uh, <laughs> we've, got, we've, got, we've got some questions coming in uh, from the audience. We'll just get to them in just a moment before this uh, final picture we've got to show the audience. Man, that's a, that is gorgeous. I love that picture. <laughs> wow. So the one thing about cameras in our eyes, you can see lines in the atmosphere and there are different altitudes, you know, different chemical compositions in the atmosphere. Um, it's also refraction from sunlight. So, you know, the red light goes straight through the boot, the blue light gets bent, which is why at the level of the sun, you see red and orange, it's lower frequency and it travels more directly. The blue light and even purple is higher frequency, so it gets bent more or refracted more. But the way the, the, way the camera captures that is different than the way my eyeball saw it, like just the lines were different. And I remember like I'd take a picture and look on the preview screen and look outside, I'm like, that's not exactly the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's still pretty close. And that, you know, the, the edge of the earth are the limit that we can see is probably between one and 2000 miles away. It's, it's, you know, a couple, a couple thousand kilometers away. Yeah. So you're, you're looking a long distance in that shot. And that's, that's with a telephoto lens there, probably two or 300 millimeters, maybe. Wow. That's fascinating. We've actually, we've got a question in from Seri Flavel. Uh, thank you for joining us on Facebook. Uh, what do you think NASA's next goal should be? <laughs> well, I agree with their, the broad strategy that they have right now is keep on operating the space station and then um, go back to the moon. I think the moon should be used as a testing ground, um, kind of as an engineering testing plan for to eventually send people to Mars. Um, the there has, there's been discussion about maybe doing a gateway, like a, a space station in orbit around the moon. And I'm, I'm not a fan of that. I've, I've spoken pretty openly that I don't like that plan. Um, I think we should just send people to the moon. If you're going to go to the moon, go to the moon. Don't just orbit around the moon. Um, 
but uh, I do, I do like the plan to eventually send people to the moon, hopefully sooner than later. But this little thing called COVID happened. We borrowed a few dollars to our debt. And so I'm not exactly sure what the timing on those programs are going to be. Uh, well, talking about the moon, uh, let's move on to the questions we've got from uh, the kids. Um, starting off with a question from Autumn. How do you move around in space when you're floating? Autumn, that is an amazing question. It's important because it's very different than how you move around on Earth. If you tried to walk in space, your foot would just shoot you up to the top of the module. You would just go bouncing. So you can't use your feet to move. You have to use your hands and you have to hold on. So it's like you're crawling around, growing from handrail to handrail. And when you get to where you want to go, you slide your feet underneath those handrails. So there's all these um, handrails. Uh, they're, they're like just little thin metal bars that you can stick your feet underneath and hold yourself in place. Um, we have a few like foot official foot stands that you can slide your foot into. But for the most part, we just use the handrails and slide your feet under. So you wear socks every day in space. You don't wear shoes because you're not walking and you don't need them. Um, and so you just wear socks around every day. If you're running on the treadmill, you have to wear shoes. But other than that, you just move around with your hands. And if you need to go, if you're going to do a, if you're not just going to crawl, if you're going to push and float somewhere, that takes time to learn. Because if you push and you're not good at what you're doing, you'll, you're going to spin yourself around too. So you'll end up spinning while you float through the space station and you might not get to where you're going hands first. You might get there back first. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. So it's a, it's a skill that you still have to learn over time. Though. Right. Okay. Um, thank you, Suzanne, for joining in from Germany. Um, Daryl is saying, hi, Terry. Um, I sent you something to your mom and dad's so house. Hope you got it in time. Um, <laughs> and that they, that they miss you. Thanks for joining in, Daryl. Hope, you, hope you're enjoying the show. Um, well, let's move on to our next question from Jaden. I was wondering how long can your air tank last to breathe on the moon? That is a really important question because if you open up the window, there's no atmosphere out there and you'll die. So the only air you have on the moon is what you bring with you. Um, and what's and the same is true in on the space station too. It's not just on the moon. So on the ISS, we have enough oxygen stored up for a few months. Um, you know, we can, we can literally go for months, um, and for food, for oxygen, for supplies, um, sometimes more than a year. And there's a group of folks in Houston that track that their job is to keep track of all the supplies that we have and make sure we have enough. When I was in space, that was really important because we lost three cargo ships that blew up, uh, orbital Cygnus blew up, a Russian progress blew up and a SpaceX dragon blew up back to back to back over an eight month period. So the space station was getting low on supplies. Thankfully, they had planned and they had, you know, all of this backup equipment that we had margin, we had supplies. It was probably over a year worth of, of oxygen. Um, when we go to the moon, we're not gonna have that much uh, oxygen supply. Yeah. Uh, the Apollo guys only had a couple days worth, you know, there was not a lot of extra, extra oxygen to breathe in, um, on the space shuttle, if you stretched it out really long, you could go about a month. Um, but you never wanted to do that cause you'd run out of other things, but, um, the supply, the limiting factor would either be oxygen on the shuttle or carbon dioxide removal. Cause when we breathe out carbon dioxide, um, we use these things called lithium hydroxide cans that pulled the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So we had about roughly about a month on the space shuttle. So a few days on Apollo moon ships, a month or so on a space shuttle and on the space station, probably a year. Interesting. What, what about, what about when you're out on a spacewalk? So when you did three spacewalks, go to right. <clears throat> right. So then, the consumables, again, we call it consumables, limit is usually about nine hours, maybe eight hours, nine hours, something like that. And it can either be oxygen or carbon dioxide. Because again, those those um, we have a special device that takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. 
And it depends on the person. Sometimes it's oxygen, sometimes it's CO2 that's the limiting factor, but that's based on uh, your body. Like some people's bodies breathe more oxygen, some people's bodies breathe out more carbon dioxide. So every astronaut's a little bit different. But what's interesting about the atmosphere too in space, as you know, on earth, our atmosphere is about 80% nitrogen and only 20% oxygen, but humans don't um, consume nitrogen. Nitrogen just comes in and it goes out, comes in our bodies mm -hmm. and goes out. But we actually consume the oxygen. So our lungs are smart enough to have these uh, parts of the lung that suck in the oxygen, put it in our blood, our, yeah. it goes through our body, it turns it into energy um, and muscle, and then sometimes fat. <laughs> and then you breathe out carbon dioxide. So your body is like this oxygen plus food equals CO2 machine. Um, but we don't ever consume the nitrogen. So on the space station, uh, the nitrogen kind of stays there forever. And it's only the oxygen that we have to reply or re uh, replenish. Very rarely do we ever have to put, you know, bring up nitrogen to the ISS. Okay, that's interesting. And a follow, follow on question to Autumn coming in from the Ringler family. Um, and they're asking, were there any funny moments that you can share um, when they were trying to get from one part of the station to the other? That I can share. <laughs> so actually, <clears throat> we had this competition where you would start on the end of the station, like in node two, which is the very front, and you'd yeah. kick off and you try and see how many modules you could float through without banging onto the wall. Um, and that's not easy. And like, there really is, you know, there's different levels of skill between astronauts, how good they are at floating around. Just like on earth, some people are good athletes and some people are not in space. Some people can float really well and some people are not so good. So that was a really cool thing. Or you'd start back in the Russian segment and push forward um, and try and make it all the way to node two. And in the front of node two, we had all, we call it a bungee jail. It's all these bungee cords to, if you got a bag, you just throw it back there and it stays in place. So when you get to the bungee jail, you, you and then bounce off of it, but it was like a soft landing. It wasn't like just banging into the wall. Well, that sounds extremely fun. It was really fun. Okay. Uh, well, let's move on to our next question from the kids. Uh, we've got a question from Max. Hello, my question is, what is the moon like? Well, that's a cool question, Max. I have the same question because I have never been to the moon. We haven't sent people to the moon in almost 50 years. The last Apollo mission, Apollo 17, left the moon in 1972 and nobody's been back. So hopefully we'll send people there soon. Um, the moon is very uh, gray and brown. When you see it in the sky, it looks gray, but actually when you're there, you can you see a lot more brown. Um, but it's very rocky. There's no water or anything like that. There's no trees. There's no nothing, just rocks. Um, some of them are crushed up rocks from where meteorites hit the moon billions of years ago and made all this cr crunchy, you know, dust. And some of it is from volcanoes. The moon used to have volcanoes and there's, they call them mare, which means seas. But if you look at in binoculars or in a telescope, you'll see these big, dark, smooth circles. And those are from volcanoes that erupted and put lava out. Um, so the moon is super hot when the sun is up and super cold when the sun is down. It's like plus or minus 250 degrees or more. It's, it gets really hot in the daytime and really cold at night. Um, and you have a two week day and a two week night. That's why we have months on earth because it takes the moon about 29 days to go around the earth. And while it's doing that, you know, half the time you're in darkness and half the time you're in light. So if you were living on the moon, you'd have a two week long daytime and a two week long nighttime. And um, the gravity is a lot less. The gravity is only one sixth of what it is on earth. So when you see the Apollo astronauts bouncing around, that's, they have gravity, but just not very much. So um, those are some of the cool things about what the moon is like. Oh, what, what a great question, Max. Um, thanks for that. Um, next, next up is Elijah. Hi, my name is Elijah. And how does an astronaut sleep? <laughs> Elijah, that's an important, I had the same question before I flew. 
because um, I was worried, you know, can I sleep? Here's a picture of me in my sleeping bag. So uh, we have a small little area. It's like a phone booth. If you don't know what that is, ask your parents because they don't have many of those anymore. And um, the you close the door and it's your own space. So that's where you sleep, turn the lights off. Um, I would get in the sleeping bag, zip it up, put my head in like that and just be completely inside the sleeping bag. When I took this picture, I stuck my head out just so you could see, you know, a person there and um, float. In the picture, I have a bungee cord around my waist holding me in place so you could see me. But when I was actually sleeping, I would just float and it was really cool. So um, sleeping in space is a lot of fun. Uh, sometimes I would put headphones on and plug it into my laptop and listen to music, which was really cool. It was in, it's interesting to say it was really fun because a couple of weeks ago we were speaking to um, Michael Lopez Allegri on Space to Alive. And he said mm -hmm. he, he didn't really enjoy it as much because he, he kept waking up um, and it was difficult. Yes, I think some astronauts have that experience. And for me, I never had any problem. I went to bed. I, we had, before there were Fitbits, we had a, a special, um, they call it an acta watch. It was like a watch that would measure your activity. And, um, uh, you know, something like, like, a, like a normal, my Omega watch here. Um, so that would measure how you slept. And when I was in space, it was complete flat line. I was just out mm -hmm. on earth. It would kind of bounce around and toss and turn and stuff. But personally, I sleep better in space than I do on earth. Wow. Interesting. Um, well, we've got one more question from the kids uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll definitely try and get your questions in actually and Anjana, don't worry. Uh, we've got a question from Thea. I would like to ask an astronaut how, our, um, how fast their rocket went. So fast, Re it went really fast. Um, in order to get into orbit where the space station is, you have to go about eight kilometers every second um, or five miles a second. So they have to travel really fast because basically you're falling towards the earth. Just like if you if I had, take my phone here and I drop my phone, it's gonna fall towards the earth. In space, it's the same thing. You're falling towards the earth, but you're also moving forward really fast. And so falling and moving makes a curve. And if you're at the right speed, which is roughly 27,000 kilometers an hour, about eight kilometers every second, um, you make an orbit. That shape of that curve is the same shape as the earth and you're in orbit. Great. Well, that brings us to the end of our segment um, from the kids. I hope you guys enjoy that. I hope you guys are tuning in, if not catching up on YouTube um, later on. We've got a question from Karen um, um, in our live audience. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges for doing astronaut missions that, if solved, would make it simpler or easier for astronauts to do those missions? I think it's Karen. Right. So one of the uh, biggest problems that we had when I was there was that the carbon dioxide machine required a lot of maintenance and it's an amazing machine. It like takes CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, on earth, we have trees that, that do a great job of that, but we don't have that in space. So yeah. you have to do it with machines. And the American segment has this really cool recycling system that can recycle carbon dioxide and water, um, and turn it into water and oxygen. And so it, it's a, it's an amazing system, but the problem is it breaks. And so I spent a whole week fixing it early in my mission. And then towards the end of my mission, I spent a whole nother week fixing it. Uh, and so that's something that if they can figure out how to make those machines either easier to repair or less needy of repairs, um, that's going to really help in the future. Yeah. I also read in your book that, um, you spent some time fixing the toilet quite a few times. Yeah, I was the toilet was did that. did need did need work. So the toilets we had uh, when I was there are Russian, um, even though they were modified to work on the American segment. I think they have a new American one now, but the when I was there it was it was Russian ones, and it was um, you just have to replace this part or that part. Uh, and it's with Russian technology, which is different than American. So like the bolts are different and the screws are different and the, 
the electrical connectors are different. And so it was a different experience working with the Russian hardware, but it, it works really well and it, and it uh, is very reliable. That's good. That's good to hear. Um, yeah, keep your questions coming in, guys. Uh, we've got another question from Ground Base Space. How did it feel to take command of the ISS knowing you were one of the STS-130 crew that actually helped complete its construction? Uh, it was really, it was really fun. It was especially fun to go back in a node three and the cupola, which were the two modules that we brought up on 130. And they were also the final modules. They were the final, it was the official end of building the space station. There's been a few other small things that have been added, but, um, it was really, it was really fun to go back and see like, wow, man, the last time we were here, this was pretty empty or this was clean or in the cupola, the window panes were all scratched up because there's these plastic covers on them to protect the glass and the plastic was all scratched up. And I remember thinking, what the heck have people been doing in here? <laughs> the scratch <laughs> or scratch this stuff up. So that was a lot of fun going back. Yeah, that's interesting. Thanks for your question, ground based space. Uh, a question from Akshay. What was your most difficult moment as an astronaut? <clears throat> um, in 2003, I was a family escort for SES-107, the Columbia mission. And of course, Columbia uh, had an accident, it killed the crew. And so that was definitely the most difficult moment. I was down at Florida at the runway for landing with the families as we were waiting for Columbia to land. And of course, 15 minutes before landing, it broke up over Texas. So uh, that was for sure the, the most difficult. How did you deal with that then? Is that part of your training? Uh, I mean, we had a lot of training on like, when this happens, you have to call this person and you're going to go here. You know, we had the, the a plan. It wasn't training, it was planning. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, but after that, it's just human uh, emotions and relationships yeah. that, you know, it's not, you can't train for that. Yeah. Um, it brings me on to the point we just spoke about earlier, how um, you specifically look for soft, look, uh, you favor soft skills more than technical skills in an astronaut. Right. Um, and how, how was the psychology, how, how is the psychological aspect of going up into space or dealing with emergencies? Yeah. That's a whole conversation on its own. Um, yeah. it is, uh, like you said, I think when you're applying to be an astronaut, those soft skills are probably the most important, um, thing that that i look for anyway when i when i was helping to select new astronauts because you want somebody that you want to be with for six months in a stuck in a can together right yep. um there's a lot like i said there's lots of smart technically competent people out there but you really want somebody that has a a, a personality that can get along well with others especially people from different backgrounds and nationalities um and uh and when you look at the history of exploration, especially going to the Arctic or Antarctic, uh, Navy guys underwater in a sub, um, space station astronauts, the ability to get along with your crewmates is always like at the top of the things that make the mission successful. Yeah. Well, let's change, let's change the tone a little bit, uh, slightly. Uh, we've got a question in from Anjana. Thank you for your question, Anjana. And she's asking if you had any scary experiences while you were in space. Um, I mean, launching, uh, it can be scary. C coming back to earth can be scary. Uh, going outside on spacewalks can be scary. Um, we had one that was such a, such a, it was a big deal. Um, the um, ammonia leak alarm went off and the ISS uses ammonia on the American side as a coolant. So kind of like your car's radiator fluid, that ammonia is, um, uh, is what keeps the equipment and the people cool. And it's also a very deadly chemical. And so one day the alarm went off and which meant there's ammonia leaking in the atmosphere. So you got to put on your oxygen mask right away and you go down the Russian segment and close the hatch because they're, there, the theory is the atmosphere should be clean on that half of the station. And they said, you know, it's, it's not leaking. You can go back. We went back. And then they called us uh, with a radio call and said, just kidding. There, there really is a leak and you got to put your mask back on and go back down. And this is an emergency procedure. Like you just jump into action immediately. Um, 
so we had to do that twice. And we spent the whole day thinking that ammonia had actually leaked into the ISS. Um, and with all that being said, at the end of the day, they said, just kidding again, it, it didn't leak. But when you go down to t just test the atmosphere, just to be sure and keep your masks on. So that was, you know, we spent a day thinking that the ISS was going to, was going to die. Wow. That, that must have been scary. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. It was, it was, it was a memorable day. It was a whole chapter in my first National Geographic book. And I wrote about it in my How to Astronaut book also. Yeah. Um, well, we're talking about your How to Astronaut book. Um, a reminder to everyone tuning in, remember, you can grab your own signed and personalized copy from Terry on the Space Lab website. There's a link in the description to go grab your copy. Remember, we have limited copies available and it's only available till the 1st of April. So make sure you get your orders in for then. I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, spacewalks. Uh, you went on three spacewalks during your second um, space mission. We have a picture here of you outside the space uh, station. And I wanted to ask, how how can you just how do you describe that moment when you step in to the void of space for the very first time? So um, it's a big deal. I you know I thought I had done stuff. I flew all these different fighter jets. Um, I had been a space shuttle pilot. I did a rendezvous. You know, when you go outside into space, that's you know that's a serious thing. Um, you have this little thin visor. It's like a millimeter thick piece of plastic that's keeping you alive on the other side of that plastic is instant death, as I like to say. So you have to, you know, just keep yourself focused on what you're doing and not get too overwhelmed by that. The very first thing I did when I went outside, um, I had a tether on the side of my, uh, spacesuit. So I took the tether, hooked it to the handrail and then let go. And I just looked down at the earth at the space station floating. Um, yeah, right. So imagine me being there only letting go and just looking around. And uh, I didn't fall, I didn't to get vertigo or anything like that. So I was good, but I just wanted to make sure that my brain was going to be good. And it was. And so I didn't have any problems, but it was, it's a pretty intense and you're very focused um, during a spacewalk. How, how, do you, how do you find the balance between trying to enjoy the moment as well as also focusing on the task at hand? Yeah, there. So basically, it's ninety nine percent task at hand and one percent enjoy the moment. You know, every once in a while, I'd stop and look around and go, "I'm seeing creation here. Like this is God's view of the universe." And then I have to get back to work. And so, it was ninety nine percent not fun, just work. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that sounds that sounds fascinating. Would do, Would you ever want to go on a spacewalk again? Um. I would do it. Sure. It, it, you know, if I were on the right mission and, and, uh, I, you know, I left NASA, so that's kind of a one way door when you, when you leave NASA. Um, so I don't plan on going back again, but, but you never know with these private space companies, things could happen. Um, mm -hmm. you just never know. Yeah. Well, we've only got, um, five more minutes left on the show. Um, uh, thank you to everyone who's tuned in. Thank you, Lisa. Um, oh, a question from Lisa actually just coming in is, what do you do if someone becomes seriously ill on board the ISS? Right. So actually, I was our crew medical officer. So I went through medical training and I got to work at the local hospital here in Houston at the emergency room and the operating room. And that was awesome. I, I really enjoyed that training. It was really good. Um, so thankfully, no one had serious illnesses. I had this chronic cough I got when I was in space. I had, everybody has skin problems, which is kind of weird. You get kind of rashes, which is bizarre. Um, uh, we had just a few minor headaches and stuff. Nobody really had any big problems. We, I did do the first ever tooth filling. One of my crewmates fillings fell out. So I had to replace a, a filling in his tooth. That was kind of cool as a space dentist. Um, if you had a really big problem, we have an AED. So if someone has a heart attack, you could help try to revive them. Mm -hmm. um, you can bag someone or so give them oxygen, put a mask on and, and give them oxygen. Uh, there's sutures, you know, for stitches. Um, there's some minor things, but if you were having some type of unusual major problem, you'd have to get in the capsule and come back to earth. And that, you know, that could be up to 24 hours by the time you get the capsule ready. You, you have to wait for the orbit to pass over 
the correct landing spot because um, <clears throat> you could just jump in the capsule and come back to earth and land in the ocean, but that would be not an optimum situation. So yeah. for really big problems, you have to bring them back to the planet. Yeah. Well, talking, thank you for the question, Lisa. Talking of problems um, astronauts can experience and do experience in space, let's talk a little bit about uh, deep space and the effects mm. of radiation that astronauts are going to have to do handle when eventually going to the moon and mars um, and you speak right. about there's a whole chapter in chapter in your book about uh, deep space and you speak about that you actually experience the effects of radiation um up at, when you're up on the iss and yeah you described it as white flashes when you close your yeah. eyes right so you saw that uh aurora picture earlier in the presentation and that's um radiation coming from the sun, but there's other types of radiation that comes throughout the galaxy. They're just big, heavy particles going, you know, almost the speed of light. They go right through the aluminum structure of the space station, right through the equipment. And when they hit your eyeball, um, they make your optic nerve fire. And so oh. if it's nighttime, or if you have your eyes closed, like you just close your eyes and one of these particles hits you, either from the sun or who knows where it's coming from, it, you see a flash. And, um, the first, I saw it on the, my fifth night in space. I still remember it. I was on the space shuttle and I remember thinking I woke up or I didn't, I hadn't fallen asleep yet. And I went, that's it. That's the, <clears throat> that's the, uh, you know, the white flash, the Apollo guys talked about that. Yeah. And it's kind of cool, except, you know, if one of those is hitting your optic nerve, there's a thousand other ones hitting the rest of your body yeah. and that, and they can, it's called ionizing radiation. It can be, and it, if it hits your DNA, it could mess up your DNA, which could cause cancer. And so yeah. after both of my flights, I ended up having skin cancer. Um, and so it's hard to say where it came from, but you know, I got it after both of my space flights. So I'm guessing it probably came from being in space. Yeah. Wow. Sounds scary. Um, thanks for your question, Lisa. Um, thank you for tuning in, Karen. Uh, we've got a question from Mary asking about how do you adjust to gravity when coming back? Uh, for me, the first day is really rough. You feel heavy and you feel very dizzy, like really dizzy. It's kind of hard to walk around. Yeah. Um, but then um, it was a... Uh, uh, it was like the second day it was better, but still dizzy. The third day it was a little dizzy, but not too bad. A week after I landed, um, I did this balance test. It's a physical test. You get in this box and they, and they, um, uh, measure how quickly you can adjust to motion. And my balance score after a 200 day mission in space was better a week after landing than it had been before I launched. Um, so it was, it was Wow. Uh, it was, I was amazed. I did not yeah. expect that. I was kind of shocked. Yeah, you, you mentioned in also, uh, again, in the book, which I'm finding a fascinating read, by the way, um, is you say you're blessed with a body that was made to go <laughs> to and from space because you, right. you, hardly, you hardly felt the impact. Uh, like you, as you said, you, you were fine after a week of coming back to Earth. I, 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 I was really surprised. Um, I, I did a lot of workout. I, was on the exercise machines a lot in space. I, I, I did it religiously every day. And then when I got back, I went to the gym every day because I wanted to get my body in good shape. But physically, I did 20 pull-ups the week I got back. You know, I, I, I came back in good strength. Um, the first, on my first flight, <clears throat> I had the worst headache for the first two days. And then on the my third morning, it was like a light switch got flipped and all of a sudden I was fine. But man, mm -hmm. I felt sick to my stomach and I could barely move my head for about two days. And then my brain just figured out what was happening. It was like, Oh, okay. Now I know what's going on. And it, yeah. and then I was, and then I was, I had a big smile on my face for the rest of the time. Yeah. That's good to hear. Well, since, since you, you, it feels like your body's perfect to travel into space. <laughs> and we spoke a little bit about um, the future of space exploration and potentially private crews, um, going to maybe Mars in the future. We, we know we have a we have a private crew next year with Axiom 1 launching to the ISS, the very first um, private crew. Right. Do you think, do you think um, you'd, you'd opt in for something like that? Sorry, say that. What was the last question? Would, would you opt in for a oh. pri private crew 
going back to the ISS or potentially somewhere else? Somewhere else. Um, so I, you never say never. Uh, you know, it depends on what the mission was and what the purpose was. I've always said I'd love to go back to space to film a movie. Um, so uh, yeah, that we'll see. I mean, I, I'm not planning on going back. I have yeah. a million projects I'm working on right now, but uh, who knows? Who knows what the future holds? Yeah. Well, I think um, we should wrap the talk right up there. It's yeah. been an absolute pleasure, talk, pleasure talking to you. Um, I, I must mention that you've been on you've been on the Joe Rogan podcast. You've spoken to uh, you've spoken to Neil deGrasse Tyson. So it's an absolute pleasure for me to um, get the opportunity to interview you um, once again. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in to Space Door Live tonight. Uh, a couple of things before everyone leaves is remember you can grab your personalized signed copy of How to Astronaut on the Space Door website with a link in description. That's only available till the first of April, and trust me, it's a very good read. Um, and next Tuesday on Space Tour Live, we have the Space Roundup, where space experts and astronomers Nick Howes and Terry Mosby bring you the latest and greatest of space news. So tune in at 7.30 p.m. next Tuesday for that. And next Thursday, we have another special event here on Space Tour Live. We've got another episode of Accessing Space. You guys might remember that from back in December. Now, Accessing Space is an initiative we've started here at Space Tour Live to show you guys and show everyone the world how space is inclusive for everyone. And next week's episode is about women in space. So tune in for that. Uh, we've got, um, I think, six wonderful women in space joining for a panel event at 7 p.m. next Thursday. So same time on the YouTube channel. Um, don't forget to tune in then. And once again, Terry, thank you so much for taking the time out um, from your busy schedule. Uh, thank you to the audience for asking some wonderful questions. And yeah, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. It's been great. This is a lot of fun. Great, great questions from the audience, but especially from the kids. That was a lot of fun. And uh, I've got a, I've, I've also forgot to mention, I've got a podcast that we just started and it's coming out next week called Down to Earth with Terry Verts. So great. just let everybody know about that. Yeah, well... Check that out on Spotify, Down to Earth with Terry mm. Vert. Go check that out yep. on all um, podcast platforms. And that gives me a chance to also plug in Space Tours podcast, which we've also recently started there you go. Um, a few weeks ago. So go check that out, Space Tour Live on the go. Um, and you can experience space everywhere and every day. Um, yeah, it's been great. I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you guys for tuning in. We'll see you next Tuesday back again with a roundup. Thanks, Terry. Hi, uh, my name's Nick Howes, space enthusiast, author, writer, broadcaster. Hi, I'm Terry Mosley, past president of the Irish Astronomical Association, lifelong astronomy and space nerd, absolutely fascinated by everything both man-made and natural up there. So every two weeks, Terry and I give you the latest, hottest news from space and uh, human spaceflight, robotic spaceflight, and what's happening up in the skies. Um, please tune in to us every fortnight uh, with the space stuff. Hi, I'm Anita Burney and I'm delighted to be moderating Space Door's upcoming Accessing Space show, streaming live on Thursday the 25th of March at 7pm GMT. This is a really exciting time to be part of the space industry and we're bringing together a brilliant, passionate group of space experts and space champions who are going to share their career journey experiences and their career advice with you. So bring along a drink, a question to ask the panellists and a piece of advice that you'd like to share with others and we'll do our best to include your contributions in this live interactive session. So join us online live on Thursday the 25th of March at 7pm GMT.